Okay, we're, we're going to get started so that we have time for questions towards the end. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the kickoff webinar for the 2022 Spring Quarters Michael M. Davis e-lecture webinar. Uh, in a moment, today's discussion moderator, GFAP faculty director and CHAS co-director and Crown Family School professor Colleen Grogan will offer brief opening remarks and an introduction of today's presenter. Associate Professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing and an adjunct Associate Professor of Epidemiology at Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine, Matthew A. Davis. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please type the questions in the Zoom Q&A pane for answering. Uh, the chat function will open later in the presentation so that we have a robust discussion following the presentation. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available on the CHAS website, which is chas.uchicago.edu, as well as on the CHAS YouTube channel by searching for the Center for Health Administration Studies. And now Professor Colleen Grogan will introduce today's presenter. All right. Thanks, Keith. Um, welcome, everybody, as Keith said, to the um, the Davis, uh, Michael Davis Lectureship Series um, for our spring quarter. Um, uh, we um, have a, a great list of um, presenters this quarter, so please uh, continue to join us every Tuesday at noon. Um, we also welcome any feedback you have. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, visit, visit the CHAS website and feel free to um, uh, give us uh, a few thoughts about what you're thinking. Um, <clears throat> so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Matthew Davis uh, from the University of Michigan. I don't think there's any relationship to Michael Davis, <laughs> but it certainly seems appropriate to have our first <laughs> speaker this series be another Davis. Um, uh, Matt is um, in the Department of Systems Population and leadership, um, also in the University of Michigan School of Nursing, um, and which is, I think, also part of the medical school at the University of Michigan. Um, so Matt uh, has um, done uh, a lot of um, research in the area of um, health services and data science. Um, he focuses on observational data and um, using this to kind of uh, do some data mining methods um, with large administrative healthcare data sets, uh, which many of us um, have been quite interested in um, associated with um, Chaz. And so I think we're going to learn a lot today. Um, and you know, I should say he he does this all with um, with an aim to to um, uh, to provide some policy relevant um, uh, uh, information and um, and to 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 really make a difference um, in the world. He's received numerous um, grants from NIH, um, specifically from, mo most specifically from um, the National Institute on Aging um, and uh, many, many publications uh, related to, to this research. So with that, I'll let Matt take it over and I'm just really interested to hear what you have to say about um, suicide risk among U.S. healthcare workers. So thanks very much and welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Audio yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, I, I really appreciate that warm introduction and the opportunity to come and spend a little time with our, our Western facing uh, neighbors. Um, so a uh, couple remarks just before I jump in here. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different than a typical research seminar. I would say it's, it's sort of a mix of presenting the findings of our work, but also it's going to be a little bit of teaching. Um, one of the things I've come to recognize and appreciate is, you know, diverse audiences. And um, from my understanding, there's a fair number of trainees. So I've, I've interdispersed a little bit of teaching in here to make sure we're all on the same page and interpreting some of these epidemiology measures and um, as well as the results. So hopefully everybody will get a little something out of it. Um, so I chose to present this, this particular project. I, I get the opportunity to work on a lot of different things because I'm somewhat of a methodologist and my specialty is leveraging national health data. I picked this one for a couple of reasons. Um, this is an example of an up and coming data set that could be of interest, I think, to some people at CHAS uh, and people you know, doing social sciences type of work. That's really interesting for a number of reasons that I'll point out. 
and it's accessible. It's something that you really can get access to if you're interested in learning something about violent deaths. And when I say violent deaths, I'm referring to homicides and, and suicides. And uh, in particular too, you know, from my perspective, this is um, some of our findings we believe are, are pretty important. Um, so this is not gonna necessarily gonna be a typical, you know, study that looks at evaluating a health policy, but our hope is that the findings are important and perhaps warrant health policy, which is why you're such a great audience um, to present this work to. Um, just a quick disclaimer before I start jumping in. Um, you know, as scientists, we have this way of taking real human experiences and turning them into numbers. And that can come off sometimes as a little bit callous, uh, particularly when you're talking about something like suicide, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So, you know, if, if it hits close to home, it could be a little bit uncomfortable or unsettling. Uh, you may not want to listen to this if, if it's a little too sensitive to you. It's something that's, you know, impacted a lot of people's lives. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, don't really need this slide because I had such a great introduction, uh, but just a couple little points. Um, I have a mixed background, just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, my PhD advisor was an epidemiologist, and much of how I think is really rooted in how epidemiologists approach studying health and healthcare. I came from an institution that the specialty of the institution was using Medicare claims. Um, and when I came out, I thought that everybody did that, but apparently not everybody does. Um, but my PhD is in data science, and I do large observational research. So um, I don't collect any data. I try to make use of pre-existing data, which is can be really helpful, particularly if you're early in your career. Um, if you don't have funding, um, it's ways that you can get involved in the field early on and have an impact um, if you're clever and you understand what's available to you. And it seems like every year there's more and more data coming online. So just a little bit of background. One thing I came to realize is that people, you know, science is quite different depending on whether you go out there and collect data or whether you make use of existing data. And there's kind of pros and cons to both. Um, you know, in terms of primary data, the kind of the classical way we believe research is done where you conceive a research question, you go out there and you collect data, analyze your data and publish it. It takes a long time and it's very expensive. Anybody who's said to themselves, oh, I'll just do a quick survey have come to find doing a survey well is very difficult. Secondary data, they tend to be inexpensive overall. They tend to be very large. Um, easy to get, you can publish things from them pretty quickly. You can evaluate sometimes healthcare systems and other policy types of things, particularly with claims. The disadvantages sometimes is not exactly what you want. And sometimes you do the best you can and there are inherent limitations. This is the way I like to sort of show like the process and how it differs, you know. Um, I think of primary data collection and primary types of research as where you kind of set your research question and you fix it and you go about sort of answering it with the data you collect. Secondary data, you know, the data are fixed. They are what they are, and you have to do the best that you can with it. So sometimes you have to be a little more plastic with your research question. And I'm not saying that you just randomly make up a research question, but sometimes you got to change the definitions of the variables you're looking at um, with an understanding of what the data what the data can do. Sometimes we'll use the term surrogate measures to talk about things that we're trying to capture in an imperfect data set as best we can to sort of gain that essence of what we're trying to measure if, you know, if the thing that we actually want may not be possible. So from my perspective, these are the large buckets or large different types of health and healthcare data that are available to us. People talk about you know, healthcare administrative data that was largely developed for billing purposes. There's national health surveys, clinical data, disease registries, and other ones coming online. So from my understanding, many of you uh, work with claims, work with Medicaid data, um, my, my shop, my, the, the, the analyses that I do that are for funded projects are largely with Medicare. Um, they're kind of hard to get. They, they're very strictly regulated. You have to get data use agreements. It can take years to get access to them. Um, I've purchased data sets that were, that costed hundred thousand dollars or more, not necessarily super easy to get. There are a bunch of national health surveys that exist. These are your NHIS, NHANES, MEPS, NAMPSIS, HAMPSIS, BURPSIS, YERPSIS, a whole bunch of other ones. Clinical data is becoming more available now. It can be hard to work with depending on your institution. There's collections of data sets that exist that we call disease registries. Probably the most classic one is SEER, which is a large US cancer registry where in certain states, every cancer case gets added to that registry and then they track various outcomes. I was, I was actually, in preparing these slides, I looked up US registries. And another one that came up was rare kidney stone registry, which I had never heard of before and have never worked it, but kind of an interesting example. And then there's other stuff, right? The world is changing. Like 
we've done some stuff in my in my group where we analyzed Twitter data to look at public responsiveness to um, you know the ACA. Um, there's other federal federal data sets as well, places that you go for denominators and those types of things. So for a social work audience, sometimes you know I was thinking about an analogy like this, and you have a relationship with these data sets, you know, and um, they're like people and your family. Uh, they are you know imperfect. They have their strengths and weaknesses and you learn how to deal with them and you learn what they're good at. So the one that the, the star of this show today is the one that I'm gonna be presenting to you, which is known as the National Violent Death Reporting System. And what makes this one so special, I would classify it as a disease registry because it's basically cases of homicides and suicides, but it has links to several different types of data sets that they, that they bring into it. And that makes it very powerful um, in as a data set. Anytime that you have the ability to cross different data sets and pull in unique measures, you can do something really interesting with it and valuable. Um, just a quick side note, um, I, I once uh, I knew an individual, a, a researcher who did something pretty clever with Medicare data. So these are claims data. You don't have clinical measures necessarily in Medicare data. Um, and they wanted to do something with BMI. Well, you don't have height and weight in claims. You just don't have it. And they were clever, they, they linked the claims through a highly protected system to driver's licenses and got height and weight from the driver's licenses that I thought was just fascinating and super clever and uh, sort of a funny thing. They, they sort of counted on inaccuracies and people kind of fibbing their height and weight and actually adjusted a little bit for, for discrepancies. Um, so like I said, these, these vary in accessibility. Some of these are very accessible, some of them aren't. And that's important to consider when you're early in your career as a faculty member or as a trainee um, because you need access to information to do stuff. Um, the NVDRS that I'm talking about today, it is accessible. And what I mean is it's free. It's not publicly available. Um, you end up writing a short proposal to use it. You send it off to the CDC. They review it, ask you a couple questions, and then literally send you a data set. So thinking about, about you know, different data sets over time, one thing that I, I really work to remind myself and I remind my students is that often every row in our data set is a person. And that's important to remember when we start crunching numbers and looking at relationships. And those numbers represent real people and real human experiences. Um, thinking back over the last decade of the opportunities and the privilege that we've had to work with different data sets, there's a few papers that really came to mind that I think struck me in a profound way of the immense importance of what we were doing and what those numbers represented. Um, the first one was a policy paper we did looking at how people spent money up to the day of their death. We used Medicare data and looked at everybody who died in the calendar year and went backwards and looked at trajectories of spending to try to unpack how money, uh, you know, how spending occurs leading up to death because a lot of people think that end of life spending, if you fix that, you, you, know, you, you save Medicare in terms of cost. Another one, um, I wrote an algorithm in EHR data and health record data to go through and to extract from a, a birth cohort, a mother infant birth cohort, um, measurements from fetal ultrasound reports. It allowed us to basically growth in to model growth uh, in utero trajectories and look at how growth is affected by exposure to arsenic in this specific, specific cohort. It was kind of amazing at the time because I didn't realize until after I did all that work and got the data set together, I said, wow, this is data on people that don't even, that haven't even been born yet. And that was sort of amazing to me. And the last one, I would say that one, among the most profound data sets I had the, the privilege to work with was the one that I'm here to talk about today. Um, the NVDRS data, which at the end of the, end of the day um, was several hundred thousand um, uh, suicide cases here in the United States. So very profound. And don't forget that, you know, this is beyond an IRB checkbox, um, but more at the human level that you are looking at, you know, numbers that represent your, your, your fellow citizens, other humans, and that has a certain responsibility and a privilege. Okay, a little bit about suicide before we start jumping into what we did for this study. And in many ways, this is gonna be a story about how you can conceive a research question in your mind and go about answering it with pre-existing data. So some of you, you know, who study suicide might even know, might, might even do this background section better than I. Um, suicide has become a leading cause of death in the United States pre-pandemic. Um, uh, in 2018, there, there were more than 48,000 individuals who died of suicide. And as, as you, you know, um, with your backgrounds, you know, it's a complex public health problem. Um, 
for a long time, dating back into the 80s, people were, con, you know, were interested in understanding occupation and how occupation potentially changes the risk of suicide. And um, the focus, though, was largely on medical students and physicians. And there was a couple underpinning assumptions. Um, you know, healthcare workers in general, they're considered to have high job demands, like potentially other jobs as well, but they often are dealing with life and death, which can be pretty high stakes. Um, there is this idea of avoidance of mental health services. And I believe that, you know, um, you can imagine situations that if you were a nurse practitioner and you were having some mental health, you know, symptoms, you might be a little bit less likely to go to your own colleague who's a psychologist, psychiatrist, or a social worker um, for help because you know them, your colleagues, it's a little awkward. Um, and there's also this idea too, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of fear about issues regarding licensure and those types of things. And then the last kind of underpinning assumption um, on why this was a potentially at-risk group for, for things like suicide was that you know, people in, the health, in, in healthcare, they, they have access to medications and they know how to use them. So they have, the, they have greater means to um, complete suicide. So um, interestingly, you know, what we knew about this and much of the theory and the papers that have been written were focused really on physicians. There was very little at the time done on nurses. Um, and for my own data, from working with Medicare data, I can tell you there's around 900,000 physicians in the United States, so various types. And if you look at RNs, registered nurses, there are millions of them, 3.2 million of them. And it was shocking to us as a, being such a large part of the healthcare workforce, how little we really knew in terms of getting our arms around the risk of suicide in this population. Um, so this is a quote that I like. The challenge, of course, is not the answer, but asking the right question. There are lots of fancy methods, as I'm sure you are learning about in your coursework to do all sorts of cool, wild things. They will not make an impact alone. Methods don't matter as much as you might want them to. What's most important is that you go after something and you, you invest your energy into the biggest problem and that you can think of and conceive with potentially the biggest impact and payoff. So like many of us in science, you know, we have a running list of like ideas. Maybe they're things that your advisor has tossed out to you um, or your colleague, and you're trying to sort through like how to gamble with your time. Like what things do you want to invest your energy into? And I ask myself these hard questions before I put, put energy and resources into anything. I ask myself, what is truly novel and new or innovative about this study? And more importantly, will the findings have an impact? Do we need to know this information or not? Because you could spend potentially like a career studying something that doesn't have much impact if you get off on sort of the wrong, the wrong track. So you gotta be sort of tough on yourself. You when, you, when you put in your grants, you put in your papers, you know, the reaction that you want from that review group is, wow, we have to study this. We have to fund this. We have to publish this. The information is important. So this story that I'm gonna tell you today about this particular article, it isn't fancy methods. It's just something that we thought was important that we had to know and get our arms around um, so that we could, could assess, you know, whether there's a problem and how big that problem might be. So these were our objectives. Um, we set out to try to make the most accurate estimates possible of suicide risk among nurses. And we we're focusing on nurses because a lot had already been published on physicians. Uh, that being said too, we also wanted to compare nurses to physicians, you know, two different healthcare professions, as well as to the general population. And then next, start to, start to learn something about the characteristics of suicide and how they might, might differ between a, you know, a nurse suicide versus a, a suicide um, among a physician or the general population at large, with the idea being that if we understand something and how they might be different, there might be more opportunities to intervene. So here's a little, a little, a little tiny little teaching bit before we start jumping into looking at the measures that we created, basically a primer on incidents. These are my stick figures that I use with my students and seems to always soften the blow when you start talking about quantitative stuff and use stick figures. But the left individual is, is healthy and the right individual is sick. So there are different types of health conditions and what have you, some things that are perceived more as long lasting or chronic, then there's more acute kind of event like things. And we go about measuring them differently from an epidemiology perspective. So chronic conditions, you know, something like diabetes or hypertension or Alzheimer's disease for which there's no cure, the person develops it and they live in that state of ill health for a period of time. That's different, that's a chronic kind of thing versus situations where you're talking about health things 
that are more event-like, like heart attacks, so my, myocardial infarction, um, suicide attempts, things that are more of an acute, short, abrupt event, we go about measuring these fundamentally differently. And I see people mix these up a lot and think that they're interchangeable, they're not. Prevalence is what we use to measure, you know, how widespread a health condition is in a population. Um, that's more for chronic conditions. It helps us allocate resource to know how common or uncommon it is. Incidence is actually fundamentally a rate of events occurring over some period of time. So let me just contrast this real quickly. So if you said, what's the prevalence of this condition, the, the thicker lines, you know, demarked the person who, who's sick, the thin lines are healthy individuals. If we did our survey in 2018, December, pretty simple, you would say, oh, the prevalence is 30% and that'd be it. If you think things that are, think about things that are more like an event, a short, abrupt, acute thing, like a perhaps a heart attack, you ask yourself, what's the prevalence of the heart attack? Well, it depends. Like, when did you do your survey? How do you, you know, is, is, it, is it the prevalence right now? It's very difficult to measure an event that's a short duration uh, by, by simply doing some kind of a cross-section and a proportion. So what we do is, especially for, you know, events that lead to death, we count the number of events typically over a calendar year, and that becomes our, our numerator or our measure of like how much of that health event is occurring. This is what incidence is. We often express it as a population measure. So the number of events per population per 100, per thousand or whatever, even though it's, it looks like a fraction or a percent, it's really a rate because that, in, that time component is implied and typically it's in a calendar year. I'm defining this for you because we're gonna be talking about incidence rates, not prevalence. And I've actually seen people kind of use different things at different times. In this case, incidence as a rate of the event occurring in a population is sort of an assessment of the risk of experiencing that event among the, those group of, that group of people. This is minor, but you know the denominators in which the rates are expressed, the events are expressed, gives you a hint for whether you're talking about something common or uncommon. If you take something fairly uncommon, like the number of new lung cancer cases in the general population, maybe it'd be expressed in per, per 10,000 or per 100,000. The number of people who survive with lung cancer after five years, more common, you probably express it as percent. So it gives you a hint for, for how rare the event is that you're talking about, depending on how it's, how it's reported. Okay, enough teaching. Let's talk about this data set. Um, this is the star of the show. Um, it's, it's a remarkable data set. Um, every year, there are more and more people using it. It is a, I think it's best to think of this as a state-based registry. If you're familiar with BRPSIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, it's kind of like that, um, where each state kind of collects all their cases of homicide and suicide in the calendar year. And they go through a processing phase where they're pooling data from several different silos. And that was my previous slide with the arrows kind of that's what makes it so special they're bringing in lots of different information um they're they're bringing in information from death certificates and every death gets a death certificate right it's like a, a legal thing with cause of death and a few other things they're bringing in information on the medical examiner reports so people so so cases where there was an autopsy performed they're bringing in information from the medical examiner not every death gets an autopsy um they're much more common when you talk about things like homicide and suicide they also bring in information on law enforcement reports, which could be really interesting for different types of equity issues or equity questions and those types of things. And there's the text is there. And then for cases for which there's a toxicology exam, they bring in the results of the toxicology exam. So this is incredible, right? It's a registry to get into it. It has to be one of these types of cases. And then, then they connect all these other pieces of information that can really flesh out and help you understand what's happening and some of the, you know, some of the associated factors with that. Um, it's grown over time. Uh, so, you know, 10, I think 10 or 15 years ago when it started, uh, there were fewer states kind of involved in it and it has grown and grown and grown and grown. And now more recently, pretty much all states are in it now, if not all, um, very close to all. Um, and uh, we ended up uh, analyzing data over, I think it was 10 or, 10 or 12 years worth of data uh, and looked at some trends across time and looked at some other associations as well. So this registry, that's where our numerators came from. We had suicide cases by year and by state. Next question, how do you identify the occupation of the decedent? That was not easy. Um, 
uh, the death certificate has text data for which the data abstractors are pulling out and the occupation from free text. And it can be all over the place, right? Depending on who filled out the death certificate, it could be described in many different ways. There actually are codes to identify people who have that occupation at the time of their death versus their usual occupation. We ended up going with usual occupation because we, we sort of imagined occupation as sort of a lifelong exposure, perhaps. Um, you know, that, the difference between is if you had someone that just retired that was, that was spent 30 years as a nurse, their, their, their occupation at the time of death would be retired, but their usual occupation would be nurse. This was free text. We were concerned about missing cases because suicide is, is relatively rare. We ended up reading through all the text descriptions. There's two of us that did it. It was very painful. I think there was 30 or 40,000 different text descriptions. And with the intention of saying, we're gonna go about and find any evidence we can that the, that, that the case may have been an, an RN or above nurse or a physician. And uh, we did it independently, then came back together you know, uh, in, in that kind of a process. Um, and that's where we came from. We didn't want, just want, we didn't want, want to just use the term nurse because you can see that nurse isn't used all the time. CRNA, that's a type of a nurse. Um, so we, we thought it was worth it enough. Again, the goal here is to make the most accurate estimates we possibly could. So that's where our numerators came from. The denominators, we had to go elsewhere to get estimates. And because as you go across time, different states participated in this database across time, we needed really national workforce estimates of nurses and physicians to get meaningful denominators of the occupations by year and by state. And that is actually a little bit trickier than you think. And like, like, I, like I was mentioning, you go to different places to find the data that you need to do the work you want to do. For nurses, we got state level estimates from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And that worked because these were estimates of the employed workforce. It, was, it made sense for nurses to use that because most nurses are employed. Physicians, it didn't work as well. And we weren't getting the numbers that made any sense to us because there are physicians presumably that are small business owners that wouldn't be employed per se. So we ended up going elsewhere, oops, elsewhere for physicians and we got state level estimates of physicians from uh, the AAMC. Okay. So suicide um, incidence is typically expressed per 100,000, which as I mentioned to you earlier, it, it tells you it's still relatively rare, right? It's not very common to express it that way to get whole numbers um, when, you, when you express the rate. Now, going across time and across state, uh, across state and time, we wanted to make sure for our trend analyses that we had fairly stable estimates for each calendar year. Um, so what we ended up doing was we ended up pooling two years of data at a time as we went across to, to estimate our trends in suicide incidents because we wanted to get a little bit of stability. Uh, sometimes uh, students will ask, well, how many observations do you need to create stability? And that's usually my, my cue to remind them of the central limit theorem um, tells us, you know, you talked about sampling distributions, this idea of repeatedly taking samples, although you never really do that. But if you consider sort of each year as like a sample, you know, how many observations do you need to kick in the central limit theorem? And it tends to be around 30. So that's about typically something that we do. We look for counts of 30 to get some stability. And we do this in a lot of different things. So this is a little snapshot of the states that were involved in this registry across the, the, the time that we were looking at things. And we basically wrote kind of a cool little macro, you know, those loops that drive you crazy in class to go across and to tally up the numerators and denominators for different states uh, in two-year increments like this. And um, we actually ended up doing it in a number of different ways. Um, so as you might be aware, um, a couple of factors that influence suicide risk or the likelihood of, of suicide are um, gender and age. As you can see here, this is from my own data from this registry, which is quite large. Um, you can see that overall, you know, suicide completion uh, is much higher among men versus women. It's different when you talk about, you know, thinking of suicide, but actually um, doing suicide is higher among men versus women. We're, we're talking 30 per 100,000 among men, 10 uh, per 100,000 among women. And I was struck by how much it increases uh, among men in older adulthood. Talking to my colleagues who are geriatricians, they were not surprised by this at all. It's, as many of you probably know, as social workers, it's a well-known phenomenon that you look out for in that particular group, um, unfortunately. 
So a couple of facts that definitely are gonna influence our analyses. When we think about gender, we know that death by suicide is more common among men. Um, I can tell you that despite all the efforts to balance gender in these different occupations, nurses are still 85 to 95 to 90% women and physicians are 60 to 70% male. What were we gonna do? Likewise, if we go across these different categories of age too, I can tell you that when you start thinking about occupations, nurses tend to be younger than physicians because they, they start practicing. They don't have to go to school as long. They can start practicing earlier than, than physicians. And both nurses and physicians as groups are, av are, are on average older because they're occupations. Um, so we had issues with gender and we had um, issues with age. You would call these confounders, right? Um, things that are related to our outcome that we have to somehow control for. Now, there's a couple different ways to control for, for um, differences and things like age and, and gender. The easy thing, believe it or not, is just dump them in the model as covariates. That may sound fancy, but uh, it's not great for our intention. We actually did end up doing that as well as a mix of stratifying things. Once you dump in things as covariates and make adjusted estimates, you've created kind of an artificial world that can affect your ability to interpret it from a population health perspective. And um, as I've gained more experience over the last you know, period of time, I've thought more critically and, and been harder on myself and trying to decide, do I just adjust for those things or do I explore those things differently? And in this case, we did a little bit of both. We did some modeling to adjust for these differences, but our large descriptive analyses around the risk of suicide, we stratified men and women separately because we wanted to know what it was like in those two different populations. And that was valuable to the field. I didn't mention this at the time, but the stratification by gender coupled with the variable state across time added some complexity to our macro when we were kind of tallying up our annual two point annual two, two year estimates um, across time. It was kind of a fun little programming challenge. So we handled gender um, by stratifying and separating everything out because the risk of suicide is just so different between the genders. It didn't make sense to kind of lump them together. Um, and we wanted to interpret them differently. How do we handle age? Well, we also handled age with a, rest with, with a restriction. Um, in this case, we decided that, you know, entry to the field for physicians was 30 years plus. So we restricted nurses, both numerators and denominators to 30 years plus, as well as the, the general population when we started, started doing this stuff. That was, you know, restriction and stratification is a way of trying to create balance in the groups that you're in. So don't forget that, not just modeling. Modeling isn't the only, the only approach out there. So when we look at this across our, our kind of two, two year time increments, um, you can see the darker line here is the uh, incidence of suicide among nurses. And these dark lines here you can see among women is fundamentally higher across the entire timeline, time period. And then among male nurses, again, this dark line here is kind of a click up across the entire time period, higher, um, it sort of tails off here on the right hand side. Um, um, so uh, the other lines here, the orange lines are, are physicians and the general population is a sort of light blue line, which aren't super different. So these are the counts of the suicides across time. Um, I told you that we aim for 30 or more for stability. You can see we didn't quite get there for physicians, but I wasn't gonna go in like three or four year increments. It just seemed too coarse. Um, but nevertheless, we, we did try, to, uh, try to, to handle that. So when I look at, when you look at these rates, sometimes that can obscure it's valuable for certain things and assessments of risk, but it can sort of obscure what the, what's really going on in the world. So I took the most recent data and kind of did a quick back of, the, back of the envelope calculation of how many suicides are we really talking about. Among nurses, um, the estimated workforce is 3.2 million. After you account for the differences in gender, it works out to about 640 suicides per year in the United States. And again, this is all pre, this is pre-pandemic. Okay. One thing that we were struck by, and to be honest, like a little bit confused by, was why, why weren't we seeing elevated incidents of suicide among physicians compared to the general population? The lines bounce around a little bit, but really physicians weren't that different than the general population. This was sort of against our hypotheses based on what we knew and read about in the literature. And to be honest, we didn't believe it initially. Um, so one of the things that I, that, I, that we talk about in my lab is, we call it the laugh test. 
mistakes occur with programming, you know, before things get published, of course. Uh, and um, when we look at our data, we ask ourselves, like, does it make any sense? And often that can be all you need to track down the error that's in it. And first, when I saw this, I said, we're doing something wrong. That's not right. That doesn't make any sense. You know, we should see elevated incidents in physicians closer to nurses. So we didn't expect this. And you know what? The journal was confused by it too. And we got a lot of pushback and saying, that's, you know, what's going on with that? Like, what's wrong with this database? You know, what is that issue? And that forced us to look very carefully to understand whether we were getting it wrong and how our results compared to other results. So you're taking classes on study design, you know, or, 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 you, or you do different types of studies, you're a faculty member. There's a whole bunch of different types of studies out there, right? This is like old, but like I think some people still use it. This idea of this ranked order of like the rigor of studies and that how you put more weight into studies that are, you know, randomized controlled trials and you know, when there's enough evidence out there, you do something called a systematic review. You can do systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. You can also do systematic reviews of observational studies, um, like many of you probably do observational studies. Um, but theoretically, that's the highest level of evidence you get because it's summarizing all the evidence that you have up to that period of time. There have been numerous systematic reviews that have come out and looked at suicide incidents and risk by occupation and a focus on healthcare workers. And again, like I mentioned to you, most of the work that had been done was on physicians up to this point in time. Um, most recently, there was one that came out in 2019 that already went through and pulled all the, all, all, all the analysis for us. And like everything else, you know, showed there was higher, higher risk of suicide among physicians compared to the general population. So just quickly, we use something called relative risk when we compare incidents of two different groups. In this case, if you're looking at the incidence of suicide among physicians compared to the incidence of suicide in the general population, you compare the two as a ratio, and ratios are so handy, right, for interpretation. You know that if the, if the risk is the same, it would be one. If it's greater than that, you know there's more risk in the top and the bottom and vice versa. They're very interpretable. We use relative risk, and we use odds ratios, higher ratios, and all those types of things. So I replicated the results and went into each of those studies that that um, that that systematic review and meta-analysis did. Systematic review is a review of articles. Meta-analysis is when you take all the results and put them together as if you did one huge study. And that's what this, 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 this table is trying to show you. This, these are all the studies that had been done on physicians and the risk of suicide. And these are relative risks. So anytime it's over one, it's implying that there's a higher risk of suicide among physicians compared to the general population. Down here, when you lump them all together, uh, into one huge study, so to speak, you see that this would imply that the risk of suicide is 64% higher among physicians versus the general population. Now, over here, these weights, the results are weighted differently depending on the size of the study. And there's one in particular up here, a study by Frank, this is by, by the way, a mixture of male and female physicians. Uh, this one by Frank in 2000 has the biggest weight. So this was the biggest study with the most amount of physicians uh, that carries the most amount of weight in terms of driving this effect. Something super interesting about this study was that they used something known as proportional mortality to estimate the risk of suicide among physicians compared to the general population. So this may be like a blast from the past, but it is like a great example of how epidemiology stuff does matter and some of those things you may have read about in your textbooks, they do play out in real life. This is basically a measure. If you look at all deaths, all causes of death in a population, um, in this case, in the numerator here, and ask yourself what proportion of the deaths um, were suicide, and then compare that same kind of pie shape or, or proportion to the denominator, uh, the denominator, which is the general population. This neglects to, um, consider how common premature death is among physicians versus the general population. It's a well-known um, thing that you cannot use proportional mortality to estimate differences in risk of a health outcome occurring. It's, you know, in all your textbooks and all those types of things. And this is what those authors did. Um, so it's a relative measure, but not an overall measure of how common the health outcome is at all. Now, if you think about it, there's lots of issues with this. Um, so to the author's credit, they were very careful in this study. They said, this is not 
a comparison of risk. This really is, you know, it is what it is. It's a comparison of the proportions of cause of death, which might have some value, but it really is not meant to be used at the population level to assess the risk of something like suicide in the two different groups being compared. So this is a flaw, okay? This is not relative risk. This is not a hazard ratio. This is a different type of measure. And unfortunately, all the meta-analyses have grabbed this massive study and plopped it in, and it had a driving effect through history. I re redid everything. Um, I redid my own, this is like, this is, this is the length we're going to to try to make, this, make these reviewers happy. We did them separately for males and female physicians. And I removed the proportional mortality study that shouldn't be in there because their effect estimate was not relative risk and had other flaws with that. And this is just the results for a male because still in the United States, physicians are still uh, predominantly male. But check this out. The other thing that I noticed as well, when you look across these, most of the results were coming from specific cohorts. This was the Hopkins cohort, a, co a cohort of, of individuals in California. Only two of the studies were actually based on national data. Nevertheless, when I, when I replicate all this and I remove that one study, you no longer get statistically significant uh, uh, relative risk. Uh, and also it becomes quite a bit attenuated. It shrinks it way down. Furthermore, when I look at the two, the only two kind of comparable studies in terms of their sample, the generalizability of their sample here, this one by Rich, this one by Peterson, if you check out their relative risks, they're borderline null effect studies. We were shocked by this. We had all these plans to write this into an editorial. If anyone want to do it, please feel free. But it was a little bit shocking, right? Um, as students, you know, and, and trainees and, and faculty were led to believe that these systematic reviews can hold some answers to us. But sometimes you get stuff like that. You do need a critical eye when you decide how to construct these things. And I don't know if this was missed in the review process or what, but it's just, I think, an interesting teaching moment to take a moment. And we might not know things as well as we think we do. And you start looking at some of these articles that were published around suicide risk in physicians, the methods were very, very crude. Um, the early ones were literally looking at newspaper clippings, you know, of obituaries and things. They're not as solid as we think they are. This gave us quite a bit more confidence in, um, in our results, particularly these, looking at these two studies that were the most comparable to ours. And we felt more confident saying that the suicide risk among physicians isn't as high as we might, you, you might think. Okay, so the second piece of this study was to understand something about how suicide uh, might be different among different occupations. The idea here, like I said before, is to try to understand um, how you might be able to intervene or how they might be different or help forecast how different interventions might be more effective or less effective in the groups. So there's some really interesting, important measures in this database that we're able to use to explore how suicides might be different among the different groups we're comparing. So when you look at the method of suicide, um, the predominant method overall is firearm use. Um, so, you know, that, that, that is why people, when they talk about, you know, firearm lockup programs and those types of things, it makes a lot of sense to do that. But as I mentioned before, you know, when you think about healthcare workers, the method varies a little bit. Um, they have higher amounts of using poisoning because of access to medications and um, the knowledge to use them. Um, so, I would say that you know nurses are pretty similar to, to that of physicians in terms of um, using poisoning over other types of methods, but still overall predominantly um, firearm use is, is, is more is the most common method used overall. Um, these particular analyses are adjusted statistically for age, sex, and, and a couple other factors. The other rich source of information in this database um, was information on toxicology. Um, so these, this was a smaller segment of individuals, but still a sizable amount. Of, of suicides, uh, decedents that had toxicology exam done, which gives you some evidence of, you know, predisposing factors around substance use, um, et, et cetera. So here are the results of this. They collect information on antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, opioids, et cetera. And we're able to compare nurses to physician suicides to suicides in the general population. These are adjusted analyses as well. And we see some, some interesting things emerge here. Both nurses and physicians were more likely to um, have antidepressants in their system at the time of their death and beds on diaz diazepines as well. Um, focusing on nurses a little bit here, there was you know, marginally higher amounts of opioid use uh, among nurse decedents um, compared to the other groups. It wasn't statistically significant, but 
something that was a little bit of an indicator of that. Um, so some interesting things there that kind of might sort of forca forecast or, or talk about predisposing factors um, of things leading up to the suicide. Um, for our comparative measures in terms of understanding how risk may differ among the different groups we were looking at versus the general population, we focused in on the most recent data that we had available, which was at the time 2017, 2018. So when we talk about risk, right, and you look at sort of incidents as a measure of risk um, in a group like nurses, in this case, that point measurement was around 17.1, you might be tempted to assume that all that risk is because of the occupation um, type being a nurse. That's not true, right? There's a risk of suicide in, just for being a person in our society today. And we have to sort of account for that and sort of subtract that off. The basic idea here is that the additional amount perhaps that's partially due to being a nurse. Um, so it's always a comparative kind of analysis that we're doing here to assess how much nursing influences the likelihood of suicide and suicide risk. So most students, when they start off doing this stuff, the instinct is to do it by subtraction, which is totally one way to do it, right? This is what we call attributable risk. Um, you know, per 100,000 nurses, there are approximately nine suicides that can be attributed to being a nurse in, in the population of nurses, which is one way to frame the difference in risk. And the other way, of course, is this idea of relative risk, which basically is a, is a ratio. In this case, the relative risk comparing, you know, nurse uh, suicides among nurses compared to suicides in the general population for females, it's 99% higher. So this is, you know, sort of the money shot of our article. And I, I've come to really appreciate simple tables and clear tables, um, which is what we were trying to accomplish with this. Um, Focusing in on the effects by gender, um, the one I just mentioned before, when you compare nurse to the general population, you have almost a doubling of, of suicide risk compared to general population. Over here, comparing physicians to the general population among women and among men, we really didn't see much. Um, they were statistically insignificant, um, not too much going on there, which isn't surprising considering the lines that I showed you in terms of the graphs. When we compare nurses to physicians, we see that nurses compared to physicians, comparing two different healthcare uh, you know, occupations are about 70% elevated risk of suicide compared to physicians. So, you know, we hypothesized and we thought that we would uncover and detect higher suicide incidents among nurses. We were somewhat surprised that we didn't see the same level of elevation among physicians. And I remind you, this was just the most recent time point. In the article on the appendix that we compare every single time point, both in the attributable risk, as well as relative risk for anybody that might be interested in that. And um, you know, who knows what's going on the last few years. Um, you know, we published this you know, in, in, uh, last year and we got 2018 literally the month before and put into our analyses and submitted it. So there's a pretty decent delay um, the data that are being collected now, there probably is 2020 out there uh, during the pandemic. I imagine 2021 is probably coming online. There's a little bit of a delay because it's a lot of work for them to put all these different data sets together in all these different states and then compile it on the national level. So um, I hope my time is okay. Uh, the start of the show, back to this data set that's really rich and uh, had some really important measures in that. Um, one thing that's really interesting about it you can get death certificate data from the National Death Index, and that's actually now like linkable and claims and other things and other sources. But one thing that I found really interesting was this, this getting information from law, law enforcement reports, which could open up some unique opportunities to study different social things. Um, so in there, there was a, a variety of different things that were extracted from the text of that by the data abstractors, talking about the, the predisposing factors and circumstances that led up to that suicide event. Um, it turns out that the journal that we were seeking to publish in didn't like the law reports. <laughs> they, they didn't, they wanted the, they, they didn't think they were as trustworthy as the death certificate and other measures. So we weren't, we, we had to strike all this from the, the manuscript. So you'll be among the only people that ever see this. So I'm glad I guess something out of this because it took a lot of work, but nevertheless, these are all different factors that you might hypothesize you know, would be a factor in leading to a, a major, you know, mental health event or a, a, a suicide attempt. Um, we basically were interested to see how these factors might different might differ when you compare, you know, 
nurse suicides compared to suicides in the general population to understand if nurses were any different than the general population. All of these you could imagine would be associated with the likelihood of doing a, a, of a suicide event, but they may be even stronger or more related. And that's one way we kind of tried to get, get at it. These are odds ratios. You can interpret these just like relative risk. Um, when we compare nurses to the, to, the, to the general population, you know, if the odds ratio goes this way, that factor was, was higher was more common in the nurse suicide compared to the general population suicide. So we can see a little evidence here. We see this uptick in job. I mean, of course, a job problem can lead to, you know, a, a lot of bad things. But in this case, it's even stronger among nurses, which kind of makes sense if we're talking about this idea of occupational stress. Um, we see a little bit higher levels of depression than the general population. We did a similar same analysis looking at physicians compared to the general population. Oops. Um, a similar story emerges. Um, we see a little more likely to mental health compared to, to the general population of suicides, a little more likely to depression, job stress is in there as well. And something other interesting is their legal problems are even stronger among physicians compared to the general population. And I didn't know what to make of that. But in retrospect, when I think about it, you know, physicians have a certain level legal responsibility, often being the people that sign off on things um, and license your stuff that perhaps it's related to that. I don't know, but maybe a hypothesis. And then lastly, we compared nurse to physician suicides. And this is, you know, not that, not super important, but the, the confidence intervals cross one. So they're statistically insignificant. So in other words, they're very similar, um, the two different groups. A couple of takeaways. Um, so among women, the risk of suicide is double compared to that um, among nurses compared to the general population, which is important. And again, I remind you the nurses are predominantly female still. Um, they are uh, 10, approximately 85% or so. Um, suicide risk is higher uh, among nurses than physicians, which was a little bit surprising to us. This is a group that's already known to be at, at higher risk. Um, nurses and physician suicides, they share some characteristics. Uh, they are more likely to use poisoning than the general population. And um, there were some other substance uh, things found in the toxicology reports that nurse suicides were associated with higher use of antidepressants and benzodiazepines, actually both physicians and nurses, and a little bit of evidence of higher opioid use um, uh, uh, precipitating uh, the event. So I put this quote up to remind me to talk briefly about outcomes. So this is a, a quote from Leon Gordas, who wrote one of the most highly used, uh, he's an epidemiologist who, from Hopkins who, who wrote one of the most highly used epidemiology textbooks. And this is from his chapter on mortality as a measurement. And he writes, um, death is the ultimate experience that every human being is destined to have. Death is clearly of tremendous importance to each person, including questions of when and how death will occur and whether there is any way to delay it. So we as researchers, you know, we make choices about health outcomes or what we could call endpoints. And, you know, we, we, we often will use things like, like, um, like mortality because it's super important and it has a certain shock factor, you know, um, and it's measurable, it's objective and those types of things. But depending on what your goal is and what you're trying to do, you know, it may be the right measure or it may not be the right measure. If you think about something, this is just conceptually like a, like a suicide event and the precipitating factors leading up to that event across time, whether it's months, years, or even lifetime, you could conceptualize the y-axis as some kind of measurement of stress right? It could be self-reported occupational stress. It could be mental health issues. Um, it could be substance use and abuse. There's lots of different ways to conceptualize stress, you know, accumulating over time that might lead up, up to an, an event like that, as tragic as that. Maybe we, you might assume it's a linear thing. I suspect it probably isn't. Um, it, you know, often ebbs and flows throughout time as stress builds and, 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 and diminishes. Uh, maybe it's ex an exponential event. Um, you know, crisis interventions are incredibly important in terms of, of trying to mitigate the effects at the time of crisis. But in doing this work and thinking through some of our analyses and what people might want to do with them, it did get me thinking like, you know, there are places hopefully to intervene earlier upstream from all of this. And the endpoints might be different, you know. I mean, suicide rates and incidents are important to track to know how we're doing, 
But in terms of improving occupational health um, for the workforce of physicians and nurses, you know, there might be other, other outcomes that might be more meaningful. People talk about burnout and those types. That's a stress indicator. You know, you, you might consider uh, uh, thinking about that might be more important and more relevant to what you're trying to accomplish when you're trying to mitigate this. Um, and likewise, you know, people are starting to think about this differently. Um, there have been, I'm not an expert in, inter in interventions, but there's been some interventions that were designed for physicians that are being readapted to nurses that I think have a lot of promise. You even imagine too, like maybe the intervention should be at the time of education. Why not, you know, train providers when they're going through their formal training to be more resilient and to understand and recognize signs and symptoms in themselves and others. Um, our school at, 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 here at the University of Michigan, we've started um, mental health CPR training that all the faculty are going through and um, something similar we're looking into for students as well here to try to recognize those signs and symptoms and reduce stigma. Um, it's a unique group though, you know, it's not a group that this is a group, you know, occupation of nurses and physicians, they have access to healthcare. Why aren't they using it more? You know, um, so it's a unique situation. Um, there's some people now that are starting to work on and think about, you know, peer-based systems to try to help them take care of each other. But personally, I, I, um, I teach nurses, I teach physicians, I've gotten to know a lot of them and I worry about them because I worry about sort of silent sufferers. And there is, there can be this tendency in occupations that devote their lives, much like social work, to helping other people that you can sort of not take care of yourself. And those are the people that make it both tragic and um, a little more upsetting even. A couple more takeaways uh, tr around this idea of occupation and health occupations and suicide risk. I, you know, they have high job demands. They work in stressful environments, you know, especially with shortages of the workforce around the pandemic and sickness. They're working longer shifts. Um, there is this idea of avoidance of mental health services due to stigma and perhaps even fears of licensure issues. They have greater access to the means to complete suicide and understand how to use medications. And then there's a couple of things that we could sort of hypothesize that are a little bit different among nurses compared to physicians. Nurses in general, things are changing, but in general, they have a, a little less autonomy than physicians. And that can play out in terms of like sort of a more, a tougher workplace. Um, one of my colleagues here at the University of Michigan studies how um, physicians and nurses communicate under stress. Um, and some of those, those dynamics that occur, and some of the insidious types of communication that occurs. Um, there are some people believe some cultural issues with nursing. Um, there's this old phrase where, that says that nurses eat their young, um, that they can be hard on each other when they enter the field. Um, but there's a lot of good things happening, um, I, I think, in trying to sort of build up resilience and to rethink some of these things and try to tackle these things. But it really will take a village and more of a cultural type issue. So that's a little bit about our study um, that came out last year. And if anything, I hope that it sort of provides at least a story for how research kind of happens and how you can come up with an idea and how you can sort of sometimes make it work. Um, there, there's an editorial that discusses some of the findings in sort of a broader context. And I do remind you, this is all pre-COVID. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more attention with COVID with stress on, on healthcare workers than ever before. And it's something that we're going to continue to track going forward. Um, there was also, it was, we were also on the, um, on a podcast that discusses some more details about the study as well. So that's what I brought. I hope um, people got a little something out of that. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity and happy to chat about any questions or comments. That's great. Thanks so much, Matt. That was, that was really, really interesting. Um, maybe I'll start us off and then hopefully people will put um, more questions in the chat and um, or the, the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I have a number of questions. Um, it, like I said, a really interesting. Um, one is, uh, it, it, it just raises lots of questions, which I, about sort of other factors that might be driving this. Um, I suspect you didn't have the data <laughs> to look at some of these other questions, um, except that I, I wonder if you, you could get the data. So one is um, um, you have, I, I, I suspect you have location, but maybe you don't have the sample size to look at 
um, whether there are state or regional effects, you know, are there variations across the country in terms of um, the, the risk of suicide for nurses? Um, so that would be my first question. Um, and then also I'm wondering, do you know um, where they worked? Um, so I wonder um, if you're, most people think nurses working in hospitals, it's much more stressful than nurses working in clinics, outpatient clinics um, or FQHCs even. Um, so that would be another question. And then also um, I wondered what your definition of, of, a, of a nurse is, right? So is it an RN or was it a, um, you know, a certified, you know, a CNA? Did you include nurse practitioners? Because you, you mentioned, obviously there's a big difference between nurses and physicians in terms of autonomy, um, certainly hierarchy, right? Um, nurses and hospitals, I think there's huge questions about hierarchy, um, but also depending on whether you're a nurse practitioner versus an RN, right? That's, that's also a big difference. So lots of things I kind of threw in the mix and, um, and, I, and I have more, but I'll stop there and, and let you uh, uh, respond to some of those. Excellent questions and so well-spoken as a scientist. Um, so the regional variation thing, that is potentially possible. You get into the small count issue in terms of the stability of your estimates. The data set itself, obviously has state in it. Typically, um, you know, they very likely actually, you know, I they believe there's county and state in it. County might not be the right thing, but you could do like a health service area type of analysis at the HRR level or something else. So that is actually possible to do it with enough data, you would have to aggregate years, which may or may not be a factor depending on you know, any unique things in a given calendar period of time, but that's potentially something that you really could do. And it'd be really interesting to actually create some kind of a, we had sort of an idea to do this, but didn't really pursue it to produce some kind of a real, you know, dashboard um, to monitor whether the stuff is happening differently across the country or something. So that's my, that that's something that I think would be feasible, um, but you'd have to pull across years. In terms of our definition of RN, we debated that. And that gets into the sort of this operational definition, like what's a nurse, what's a physician? Physicians were a little bit more straightforward, but nurses too, you're absolutely right. There, there is kind of a different ways of conceptualizing that. We decided based on our, my nurse colleagues that were working with me on this, that an RN or higher would be a homogenous enough sample, which included NPs, nurses working in anesthesia, anesthesia, et cetera, but we'd not include like nursing assistants. So LNAs and those types of things. So that, that was the, the rule that we had and some of the things we went for. And then that was informed by what we were finding out there. So that was how we sort of defined that. Um, what was your last question? Oh, about healthcare institutions, right? Right, yeah. Um, that would be tougher. <laughs> um, I don't know of any way to do that or how feasible that would be with this particular data set um, because you know it's not coming it's coming from the national death index, you know, and, and other sources like that. So I don't really know of any way to meaningfully do that. Um, you'd have to do something quite a bit, quite a lot of effort into tracking that down and, and sort of attributing them to actual specific healthcare institutions. But yeah. you could make some basic assumptions if you're looking at hospital service areas or hospital referral regions or something like that. Are you familiar with yeah, some of yeah, yeah, I think that would be, you know, especially as you're going forward and looking at, um, at the years in which, you know, the pandemic um, was occurring, um, you know, we just had so many reports of nurses working in hospitals, right? So it would be, you know, I wish you could pull out um, nurses in hospitals, because I think that that was a very different experience, right, than, than in an outpatient clinic, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, but even, you know, I would argue perhaps even separate from the, it, from the pandemic um, because the hospital experience is, is so different. Also though, during the pandemic, you had nurses saying, um, you know, like reports in the New York Times. And so it would just be interesting to sort of explore this from a, a, in a, a scientific study, right? Which you had nurses saying, it's not, um, what's, you know, what, and, and these were extreme 
statements, right? Um, I, I don't want to say extreme, but I mean they were they were very provocative statements, um, which was you know it's the hospital administration that's killing these patients, right? Like we don't have the resources that we we can't take care of patients in the ways that we know we should be able to take care of patients, right? Um, and it's because of the hospital administration restricting finances, cutting staff, you know, it's it's about the behavior of the administration. So to me, that's important, not only to try to pull out our, you know, where nurses work, but also when you mention interventions, the interventions are very focused on the individual level that you mentioned, right? And I know that's not what you're doing, um, but you, we don't know where should the intervention be, right? It, it presumes it's at the individual nurse level that the nurse has to be more resilient, but the intervention maybe should be more from a policy perspective on the hospital level, right? That we need to create institutions that, um, that are, creating better work environments and more humane work environments, right? So I wonder what your reaction to that is. Uh, it'll be fascinating ecological study. Imperfect, but interesting if you were able to sort of make some basic assumptions. I was thinking too, if there was any other way you could do it, but you might be able to do some things with the classification of the way that the nurse was listed to try to deal with people that maybe are more likely to be in hospital settings. But if you had a whole other data on the healthcare institution, COVID stuff, mm -hmm. wow, that would be really interesting. Um, you'd have to wait. You, you need at least the, the, the issues would be the, the issues would be data. You, you would need at least a couple of years and probably wouldn't have enough years right now um, to actually aggregate that up. But if you had a whole other data set on COVID level measures, other types of issues at the administrative level that they were doing or policies would be fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a question here from Harold Pollack. Um, he asks, um, are there particular incident types in the care setting that require institutional safeguards due to risk of self-harm? I was wondering if medical errors, self-harm by others in the environment, extreme overtime, work discipline, or job separations might raise specific risks. Sort of a similar question that I had, I guess, in a way about kind of the work environment. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, with these big population data sets, I, you're absolutely right. There probably is a lot of granular detail in there that really do matter that we really can't get too much at with this, with this particular data set. So I'm probably not the right person to comment on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question I had, and it was your, um, I think kind of figure one where you're able to look at separate separate out um, women and men, and so you can see how male nurses. It's a bit more sporadic by time, which I thought was interesting. I wonder what you, and again, it seems like you probably don't have enough data to look at it. But by time, but did you try to so so it's weird that as you you showed how in 2018 it just almost completely converges with the general populations and with physicians, but then there are these big spikes um, in other years that look like it's even for males it's quite a bit different from physicians. But I think overall you showed that for male nurses it's not statistically significant from physicians or the general population. Did I get that right? Uh, yeah, the most recent we focus on the most recent time point in doing the comparative measures mm, in okay. previous years there were significant differences in 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 the appendix of it we do it like by every year and i see so people can pick what they want so it was significant at earlier time was but i i had the same question myself and it was something that we did double check and triple check the data those it was a little it's a smaller sample so it doesn't take as much to cause those fluctuations yeah. because there's yeah. quite a bit fewer yeah. so i i chalk up at least a, 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 a bit of that due to noise um, mm. in, in that particular group, but it, but the the male, you know, or, 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 you know that group is an interesting occupational group to look at. Um, I think for other reasons. Yeah. Um, the other, I mean, of course, one wonders about race, but I suspect that again, you didn't have the numbers to really be able to look at the impact of race um, I think we, in terms of suicide rate you do find differences in the general population 
according to race. You could do a whole other paper on that. So it wasn't, you know, we didn't focus on that, but I'm remembering my descriptive table that I didn't present today. There were some differences in race across decedents from different occupational groups and stuff. And obviously that's related to suicide as well. So that could be a focus of a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. With this mm -hmm. data set, it would, it would work, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's interesting. That seems important. Um, yeah. The other question I had, I, I thought your legal data uh, was really interesting. It's too bad uh, you can't find a, a home for it. <laughs> um, but I guess what's interesting is that the even though the, the risk of suicide is different, um, suicide completion is different between nurses and physicians, the, the kind of causes, or I think, I think what you're showing us there are sort of st potential stressors are, are similar, if I understood that correct, right? So job problems and maybe depression, is that right? Yep. yep. And so it's sort of nurses are reacting, I guess, you know, so I don't know, what do you make of that? I, I, yeah, the, those analyses um, weren't really at the population level. They were really kind of comparing whether decedents were different. If the stressors had larger effects compared to the general population of decedents. So it's a little bit different to interpret rather than it's not at the population level. Um, it more answers the question, is there anything that, that any characteristics that are, that are exceedingly different compared to the general population of, of suicides? Um, it is interesting though. I mean, the, the, I, in several of our analyses, you know, nurse decedents looked like physician decedents characteristically in terms of the suicides, the method, toxicology reports, and some of the stressors as well. Um, mm -hmm. That legal one though, it's funny, it didn't dawn on me until actually just looking at it for, for this, that there might be something interesting there. And why would that be the one factor that's different among physician suicides versus other groups? Um, so, yeah. But the job problems really stuck out. And that again, made me, you know, again, think about the role of hospitals and what's going on there. So it's sort of like another data point to think this might be important. Yeah. It's a gut check that, that the hypotheses maybe hold, you, you know, because it's like, you can say, I think what my takeaway is from that is like, job matters, of course, there's lots of stressors that matter, predisposing factors that matter, but it matters even more. Mm -hmm. you know, among those occupations. So that's the way I take it as sort of a like, yeah, that notion that there are stressful work environments and there's specific factors related to the job that might, that yeah. might change the risk. Yeah. 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 Also, I thought um, the opiate finding was interesting. Um, was it, I, I, it I, I, I don't think I caught whether it was statistically significant or not. Was it? Not quite. Um, we didn't put p values on those, but the confidence intervals overlapped. But it definitely, you know, it's an indicator there might be something there. I mean, perhaps even more interesting to me, though, was the, the higher antidepressant and benzo use among the two, you know, healthcare work groups compared to the that was pretty striking to me. And that was significant. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. That was, that was very interesting. And I wonder, do you have? Sure, you you don't, um, but it'd be very interesting to know whether that was prescribed or if they had access to antidepressants and were taking them. Yeah, um, because yeah. if there was a prescription, then that suggests, in fact, that they were hopefully getting some mental health um, services. Um, did you have? So you made the statement kind of like they're less likely to get mental health. Did you have any? any data in your to back that up? Because that could be another thing that we think is true in the data, but maybe it's not. Yeah. That is, they are getting access to mental health. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, so that didn't really come from our work. Mostly when you read, you know, these right. things in the, in the commentaries and things, people discussing it in the literature, it's something that comes up people theorize more than anything else. Um, but, you know, yeah. It's an interesting question, but you can't. I think it's pretty safe to assume that they have access. I mean, they're employed. The vast majority of these people, they work in healthcare institutions. They probably have good health insurance coverage and those types of things. Which, from an intervention standpoint, I think it's interesting because, like, we're so used to you know dealing with 
or, or trying to address, you know, vulnerable groups and, you know, give them access, you know, help them pay for things. In this case, this is different. This is a cultural occupational thing that the solutions perhaps are a little bit more intricate um, to get them to recognize signs and symptoms and everything is not as simple as just access or not. Um, but it's mostly theoretical, the, some of the stuff that I've sort of mentioned on that. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder, um, yeah, I wonder if that's changing too and how old those studies are now. I have no idea. But, and and I, I assume there is sort of a cultural aspect of sort of like we're in work that's just mentally, that, that's difficult and that's part of the job and you shouldn't need help for that. You know, sort of, I, I, I can, again, I'm completely hypothesizing, but I can, I can imagine that that would be true and you you know with these kind of burnout professions i think social work is also similar to that right that it's it can be incredibly mentally challenging um and but there's a lot of talk about self-care and so i wondered if that was changing among the nursing profession as well um anyway it'd be interesting to actually i, I had the thought that it'd be interesting to compare some other occupations that are health related presumably occupations like social work and psychology and other groups that have training on some of this stuff. I, I don't know if the evidence exists to show that they take care of themselves, but that would be potentially some pretty interesting groups to compare to um, around resilience and those types of things. I'm not, I didn't do the literature search on that, but perhaps people are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Colleen, we're, we're coming up to the end of uh, the lecture time point, but Harold has one more question um, about social worker risk uh, in the Q&A. Yeah. Um, so this other question from Harold is, has anyone examined suicide risk among social workers? Um, uh, there are so many parallels with the risk factors you identify. Yeah, Harold, you and I are on the same wavelength here. <laughs> are there feasible data to examine that question? <laughs> um, I, I'm not aware of it. That doesn't mean it hasn't been done, <laughs> but I didn't specifically search it out. Um, the, 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 one of the pluses of this data set is it's fairly new. And you know, people are discovering it more and more. Um, I think, depending on, you, you could tell me tell me this more, but like, depending on how common the profession is, like, you, you might have the numbers to do it, um, and then look at a couple of other subtypes as well. Yeah, yeah, no, really, sure. really interesting. Um, well, as Keith said, we're coming to the end of our time here with you. Um, I wanted to ask, kind of, I, I assume you are going to continue looking at this when, once you're able to get the the years for the pandemic, um, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that, and so I look forward to seeing that work because that's that's just gonna be so incredibly important to understand better what, what was happening during this time, so. We're doing some other stuff too with, with uh, substance use and different types of occupations as well. Oh, interesting, oh, excellent. Yeah, I would be really interested in, in looking at that too, so. Great work and thanks so much for um, a really wonderful presentation. We appreciate it. Um, so take care and hopefully we'll we'll keep uh, uh, hearing about and seeing your work in the future. Yeah. Thanks so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. Ab absolutely. Okay. Take care. Bye everybody.